Okay, great. Um, we're going to start right now. My name is Jonathan Bowcrack. Very honored to be the MC today. Um, this is um, part of the Dynamic Language um, series. There's a website that um, has a bunch of information about what we do. And um, one of the things that we, we sponsor are a series of talks. Um, we're, um, we, we would uh, love to have some more um, uh, proposals for talks. Um, if you want to get mail about the talks, um, you can send mail to either Greg Sullivan there or myself, and those are our email addresses. Um, today we're going to have um, a panel um, that is part of a seminar that um, Greg um, Costas and myself are teaching this semester here at MIT. It's on advanced object-oriented dynamic language design and implementation. And today we have a panel of distinguished experts on runtime. And um, this is particularly targeted towards graduate students wanting to do research in this area. And we've designed this to um, stimulate ideas and um, towards that that would be promising as um, interesting research uh, ideas or areas to pursue. Um, so we're going to have three panels this semester. Today, this is our first one. This is on runtime. We'll have one on compilation um, 424 and then language design uh, 510. And um, the way this is going to be structured is we're going to have two parts, a fixed part at the beginning. We have round robin questions um, that, that um, Greg and I have prepared ahead of time and given them a chance to think about. We'll give them two minutes each, and we're going to be um, very um, vigilant about the two-minute period. Uh, um, then at the very end, we're going to open that up to questions. We're going to give priority to the students of the class, and then we're going to open it up to the public. It's going to be um, an hour and a half total, but um, I've at least talked to the majority of the panelists, and they're willing to stay longer. And those that can't are free to leave. That's just um, so we're going to go for a while, and I'm sure there's just a lot of questions. It's just such a great opportunity to have um, such distinguished panelists. I'd like to start by introducing them. I'm really thrilled that they agreed. Um, I, I could spend an hour and a half just talking about their illustrious careers, but I'll just make it brief. At <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start with Kim Barrett. Kim Barrett, um, I worked with at Harlequin. He started... Um, by going to school at MIT, he worked at IIM on a Lisp machine, um, and then he went to Chestnut, and he worked on Common Lisp there. Apple, he was a designer and implementer of Dylan, um, Harlequin, he worked on the Dylan runtime, and just tons of things there. Now he's currently at iRobot, he's working on uh, an embedded uh, real-time Lisp called L, as well as applications like getting robots to go down to the bottom of the ocean do oil drilling and it's running Lisp. So this is a huge triumph for Lisp. Okay, um, we got Richard Kelsey. Um, uh, he's, uh, he's had an amazing career as well. Um, he's, uh, he's got his PhD from Yale. He worked on the T-Orbit project there. He's worked on the Haskell compiler. He was on the faculty at Northeastern. Um, he was at NEC working on um, uh, language research. Um, He's uh, currently, he's director of technology at Trenza, and he is one of the authors of Scheme 48 and uh, the Scheme manuals RNRS. Thank you for coming. Scott McKay is here. I'm pleased to um, introduce him as well. He's, um, he got his uh, degree from WPI. He was, um, I don't know, almost a decade at uh, Symbolics working on uh, just a ton of different things. One thing I'd highlight is he worked on um, he d was a designer and implementer of, of uh, CLIM or CLIM, depending on what coast you're from. Um, he also was a uh, designer and implementer, co-conspirator of the virtual list machine. Um, chief designer at Harlequin through 1999, worked with me on, on Dylan, and uh, he did just a ton of things there. One was uh, he did a new version of, of CLIM for Dylan called DWIM. And he worked on the development environment and lots of libraries. Currently, he's uh, chief architect at Hot Dispatch. And um, he's working on um, uh, toolkits for web applications. Um, 
And then I'm very, very pleased to have Dave Moon here, who was here at MIT um, for a long time, and he did tons of things here. Um, and I'm only going to just do a, a tiny little um, survey of those. One, he worked on um, the Maltics Mac Lisp. Um, he worked on, he was one of the main contributors and co-author of uh, the manual for the Lisp machine. He was um, a technical director at Symbolics and, and wrote a huge amount of the code. Um, and he was at Apple uh, designing and, and um, implementing a large part of Dylan. Um, currently, he's at ODI or uh, what would be Exelon. Exelon's the parent company. I don't know. All right. Well, I'm sure you're doing. You're one of the chief architects there. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, finally, we have Tucker Withington. Um, started with a degree at Harvard. He worked at MITRE and Encore, and then moved on to Symbolics, where he worked on the Ivory Board, real time list, virtual machine, just on and on and on. Tons of things. Um, he worked um, at Harlequin with me on uh, garbage collection, wrote the book on uh, Dylan programming. And uh, currently, he's at Curl. And he's um, uh, designing and implementing um, parts of Curl, especially the, the runtime. And just he's just doing a ton of things over there. Um, I really appreciate you all of you for taking time out today to come here. Um, today, we're going to start with um, like I said, a uh, round robin, two minutes per panelist. I'm going to go over the questions just very briefly, and then we're going to launch into it. Um, and we're just going to go from um, Dave. Well, actually, yeah, let's just go left to right. And, um, and the questions are, um, you know, after all this experience, which you're, which, what do you feel is a good guiding philosophy um, for pursuing this area? Um, what are um, uh, promising open problems and future directions? That's number two. Three little-known secrets. Um, four good ideas that have been dropped but whose time has now come. And five pitfalls and gotchas. OK, um, we're going to start out with number one, guiding philosophy. Dave Moon, two minutes. Um, since I know almost everyone in the room, I'm wondering if the graduate students could raise their hands and we could see if there actually are any. <laughs> um, all right. Those familiar with my past work will know immediately that this has not always been my guiding philosophy. But my guiding philosophy these days is keep it simple. <laughs> Be very, very skeptical about the advantages of adding any kind of complexity at all. Um, of course, as simple as possible, but not simpler than possible. And that's a difficult <laughs> judgment. But um, my experience says it's much easier and much more fun to design things in a complicated way than to design them in a simple way. It's much, much harder to make things small and simple. Um, so if you want to have fun, make it as complicated as possible. But if you want to be successful, um, you really need to work hard on simplicity. I can't stress that too much. Because every idea that's locally good may be globally bad. And we always overestimate our own cleverness. I know I do. And we always underestimate how much it takes to go from a great idea that almost <coughs> works to something that really works. And if the idea actually is good, and we haven't overestimated our own cleverness, and we haven't overestimated our ability to implement it, um, our sponsoring organization, whether it's company, government, or university, is going to stab us in the back and yank the rug out from under us before we can finish anyway. So we really need to do simple things that can be uh, turned into something useful in, in less than a year. Is that two minutes? Yeah, that's two minutes. OK, Tiger. First, I have to make a disclaimer. You categorized us as wizards, but I'm only a journeyman. <coughs> so if you use any of my incantations and a broom pops up with a bucket of water, watch out. <laughs> <coughs> my guiding philosophy, at least for a while, has been that CPU cycles are cheap, but people cycles are not. <coughs> I said my guiding philosophy for a while has been CPU cycles are cheap, people cycles are not. And this applies to the people can be users or they can be programmers. In runtime systems, we become slaves to cycle counts. We believe that if we take care of the pennies, the pounds will take care of themselves. So we spend hours laboring over an algorithm choice or an implementation to minimize cycle counts at the expense of our own cycles, which could be more productively used elsewhere. 
Often these cycle-driven choices result in an algorithm that's less general or less useful to our customer, the application designer, or to his customer, the, the end user, and they may either prohibit or overlook a corner case that won't be exposed until the end user gets his hand on the product, and that could be for some length of time. There's a great anecdote in John Bentley's Programming Pearls where he describes a bug that he discovered in NROF, which had lain dormant for tens of years. It was an optimization that the programmer had clearly spent a bunch of time on, a particular corner case, and he did a great job. It was very efficient. The only problem was it didn't do what it was supposed to do. It didn't work. Um, Bentley tries to speculate as to what the cost of this was, the guy's original time invested plus all the interest that compounded over the years while his code lay there doing nothing. And in the end, the payoff was negative. As a consumer of runtime libraries, you should choose a library for what it does for you and your customers in terms of functionality, not the one that produces the best benchmark. The same philosophy can be applied, I think, to compilers, languages, and applications that you should <coughs> tune for people cycles and not CPU cycles. Um. I'm actually going to, in a way, disagree with, <laughs> with That's Tucker. why we have these panels, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, <coughs> hardware constraints are not going away. You know, people talk about, you know, Moore's Law and machines getting faster and memory getting <coughs> faster and bigger and such. What that basically does is it raises where the bottom is. It brings applications that were impossible into the barely possible. And those are where a lot of the impl interesting applications and where a lot of the interesting money is, um, is new things that you couldn't do <coughs> five years ago. Um, I'm coming from, uh, fr from basically the embedded systems world these days, robotics. <coughs> um, and all of what we're doing is on that edge where you just couldn't have done it five years ago with the, at the cost, pr at the price points that make it economically feasible. Um, I'm going to agree with David um, that keeping it simple is really important. Uh, use abstractions. Um, use them religiously, diligently. If you don't, you will pay for it. Um, I don't want to think about the amount of, the number of uh, man hours I've spent over the years undoing um, assumptions that have been, that have propagated throughout a large code base. That's it. I'm, I'm looking behind us for like pods. <laughs> um, so the first thing in this little slide says, make the design as simple as possible, but no simpler than that. <laughs> so, hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's all about, it really is, it's all about simplicity, but there are still some requirements, right? Get your designs correct and get them complete as possible, but you shouldn't make completeness destroy simplicity, right? It's better to make something extendable by somebody else than to waste your time making it so com complete that simplicity goes away. And sort of beyond, you know, I'll just say it again, it's just too important not to keep saying. The, the only thing that's important in the design of, of things like languages and libraries is simplicity of API. And uh, obviously you shouldn't, you know, to agree with Kim, you shouldn't be interfering with efficient implementation, but but that's a detail. And the least important design goal of all is also worth staying, and that's that simplicity of implementation isn't actually isn't actually a useful goal. Right? That's not the most important thing because if you're designing things in a layered composable way and you've got your abstractions right, then the amount of time that you spend off making sure your implement your API is simple at a low level will just pay for itself again as you build your abstractions layer layers higher and higher. Um, yeah, uh, same thing. I feel like a pod person, but. <laughs>
I think it says exactly the yeah, same well, thing I, on his paper. I'm going down here, but I'm thinking maybe I should change my mind and argue in favor of complex interfaces just to know <laughs> <laughs> it. Um, it's funny, in the, in the uh, note they sent out to us with these questions and all, there was uh, the line that the use of PowerPoint, et cetera, is discouraged. We don't want to lose valuable time mucking with technology. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that does really seem to, uh, to sum up what you, you know, you don't want to lose valuable time mucking with technology. And I think the, partly the issue with PowerPoint um, isn't that so much PowerPoint itself, but the fact that it wasn't PowerPoint that's the problem, but that connecting up PowerPoint with whatever display technology was available, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. So it really does come down to interfaces that work. And so you have to be able to connect up what you do with what other people do, or it's, it's never going to go anywhere. Um, I could spend another minute talking about the, the, uh, how wonderful it is to keep things simple, but I think, I think we've made the point. OK, great. Thanks a lot. Um, we're going to actually change the order so that people get different opportunities to be different <laughs> positions. <laughs> um, OK. so. Um, we'll start with you, Richard, um, on the second question, which is um, interesting open problems in future directions, especially for graduate students interested in pursuing research in this area. Um, all right. I'm wouldn't you know, I didn't have much written down for this one. Um, to, for me, the, the really interesting problems at the moment all come from uh, the challenge of writing uh, long-running distributed systems in that with uh, everything seemingly connected to everything else these days, and uh, uh, programs just all spend their time talking to other programs, uh, you know, what little advances we've actually made in the, how easy it is to write programs, um, we made uh, almost nothing in terms of writing uh, distributed and asynchronous programs. I mean, to sit down and write a program that's going to run over a network on a variety of machines and run reliably is, is extremely difficult. And especially if you throw in, in, in a sort of the wider interconnectedness of things and you have to deal with failures, you have to deal with uh, malevolence on the part of other people. And also these programs are now running, they're not running in a lab, they're running out there, they're moving actual money between machines. Uh, people's lives depend on them. There's, so the, these are enormous problems in getting programs to run in those circumstances and to run for long periods of time. Uh, so I don't, I'm not going to point to any actual particular uh, parts of that, uh, but it is, it is especially a runtime issue because if the runtime system itself can't perform under those circumstances, whatever program the, the programmer wrote isn't going to work either. So uh, I think that's where, that's for me where the real challenge is right now. Scott? Okay. Um, I work in a distributed company, so for me, one of the interesting challenges is what do we do about making distributed programmers work as opposed to distributed programs work? And for me, that means some of the interesting <coughs> things about, I think some, some fertile areas for looking around are really in sort of areas of, uh, I guess, what in Eiffel would be called programming by contract and being able to prove assertions about, about contracts, about things, so that when people have made claims about, people on the West Coast make claims about such and such satisfying this, this set of protocols and whatnot, you can actually, you actually have some guarantee that that will work. And I think that gets back to distributed programs as well, because as we are loading more and more untrusted code from untrusted sources across you know, across networks and whatnot, that sort of that sort of work is very interesting and very fruitful. So, yeah, please. Um, one of the frustrations in sort of the the workspace that I I'm operating in is that there is so much variation between platforms. Um, I'm currently working on a project that is using six different programming environments to develop the software. Um, <laughs> and that's painful. <laughs> um, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons for this is that sort of 
one step back from the uh, the physical architectures, there's not a much there's not much commonality. There really ought to be. Um, the nearest thing to commonality there um, is C compilers, but even C compilers have a fair amount of variation, um, particularly when you're going fr from different classes of machine, you know, like uh, eight. 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit machines, um, and moving back and forth between those um, is is not easy. Um, so, one of the areas that I would like to see more work happening in is tools for making it easier to um, develop languages on, develop programming languages and implement them on new classes of machines. Um, it's one of the areas, well, C is used for that um, by a lot of people, but it has some deficiencies. It has a, a particular uh, machine architecture embedded in it, which may or may not uh, map easily between uh, to the what you're trying to do. Um, there's been some efforts along those lines. Uh, there's a, a project called C minus minus that looks sort of interesting, but I don't know whether it's gotten any work, any real push behind it. And there's been a number of others, uh, a number of other sort of proprietary projects along those lines. Um, so that's an area where I think that there is a lot of potential benefit um, and some interesting problems. Well, Kim proved that we didn't all collude on what we were going to say, but I am going to agree with Richard and Scott. <clears throat> I wrote down for future directions safety and reliability. I'm thinking on a smaller scale than Richard and Scott. It probably doesn't matter to me that my IM session hangs or if Netscape or Explorer execute an illegal operation. And if my email happens to be on an IMAP server that has a backup system, I probably don't even care if my email client unexpectedly quits. But I get a little more anxious when my Quicken or TurboTax crash. I know they have a reputation. They wrote all my data out to disk, but when I start the program back up and I see my database being re-indexed, or when my historical stock data disappears, or when my memorized transactions show up in a category I don't remember giving them, I start to get worried. <laughs> Safety and reliability are boring. I guess they must not sell well because all the successful products don't seem to have them. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to my guiding philosophy, lacking safety and reliability costs people cycles. If I have to re-enter my Quicken data or rewrite my Word document or redraw my Illustrator diagram, that's a cost I don't want to absorb. What I wonder is how many of these faults lie in the runtime that the application designer had no control over. How many of these faults are because the application designer didn't have a reliable automatic memory management runtime and had to design his own manual one instead? How many of these faults are because the implementation language makes the application programmer declare types left and right and then permits a non-type safe value to be passed as an argument or assigned to one of his variables? I'd like to see more research into correctness and reliability. It's been happening since 60s, 70s, and I still don't see it in commercial products. Uh, well, people always ask me about special purpose hardware, so I think I better answer that. <laughs> um, <laughs> now that it takes more money to successfully introduce a new microprocessor than it does to send five people to Mars and bring them safely home again, the answer seems like no. But I wonder if the answer might change in another decade, uh, especially now that Intel is halfway down the road of destroying themselves. Uh, some opportunities could open up. But what I really wanted to talk about is as an open problem that maybe grad students can actually do something about. Um, we used to optimize for CPU cycles when we were optimizing performance. And you know, I agree with both Tucker and Kim, sometimes you shouldn't optimize performance and sometimes you should. And when you should, CPU cycles don't matter so much anymore because today's hardware is so unbalanced with the CPU so much faster than everything else. You know, for performance in most applications other than digital signal processing, memory latency is king. And anything you can do 
to improve memory latency or work around memory latency to improve locality without the programmer having to do a lot of work to uh, make memory references more predictable in a way that whatever hardware you're using can actually uh, take advantage of. That is where there's a lot of leverage in low-level performance. And that's where, although I don't have specific suggestions, it seems to me that's where language design and runtime design can actually contribute. Can I add something to what I said? Tucker and I keep talking about this and have for the last couple of years. I think there's an open question, which is, are you better off to add on what Dave is saying, are you better off compiling to something that's actually executed as a virtual machine, or are you better off compiling to the native instructions of the machine? There's a lot of evidence that suggests you can actually get much better memory locality if you're actually executing stuff out of, out of a virtual machine. But on the other hand, when you get to, say, tight loops, well, you're not doing as well. So I think there's some very interesting compiler research to be done in the area of, of, of how to get the balance between doing virtual machine execution and, and directly compiled code. Um, my, my intuition is, is, that, is that except for very small regions of code, that emulators in today's architectures will run better than, than natively compiled code. So there's my harebrained prediction. So. <laughs> Okay, we're going to move on um, to little known secrets that you've all been sitting on. Uh, <laughs> we'll start with Cam. Um, well, it doesn't, I don't think it's little known, but it certainly seems to be less widely used than, or surprisingly underused to my, in my experience, is writing special purpose code generators. Um, yeah. Don't write, uh, you know, define a nice little declarative special purpose language and then write a code generator for it. That way, when assumptions about the underlying architecture change or the requirements of program change, it's easy to retarget your little code generator and um, it's a, a lot easier than rewriting all of the generated code by, uh, from scratch. That's just separation of policy and mechanism, which I was taught right. in this room about 25 years ago. Right. <laughs> Do you mean generating S expressions or machine code? I don't care. <laughs> C assembly, you know, generate a C file and run it through a C compiler. Um, generate uh, machine, you know, machine instructions. Generate uh, S expressions. Whatever is the thing that you need to have the the program written in you know, sort of somewhere further down the line. Um, I've got programs that write, per, that write other programs in several different languages simultaneously because they, you have, you know, three programs that need to be sort of inter, interconnected and kept in sync, you know, like a communication protocol between two processors where you need the data types to all line up and match up properly. It's way easier to, to do that by having one declaration and then a code generator that, that generates all the pieces. Good. Tucker? <coughs> um, I wrote something a little more general. I, I took a quote from this guy, Earl of Chesterfield, who said, whatever's worth doing at all is worth doing well. And I take that as meaning you don't have to spend a lot of time, not that you have to spend a lot of time creating a one-off solution, but it means you should do it well enough that your efforts can be repaid by subsequent users. A solution that is done well will get reused. It benefits from the use testing and the longevity potentially causes it to become polished and refined. And the ultimate extension of this idea is open source. And it's too bad that we don't have just open source. To me, the power of, the, of LISP and the LISP machines there's a lot of research that was done there, a lot of secrets that are still secret. They probably are going to be lost because of proprietary interests. It's unfortunate that that's the case. And flip back to the previous topic, I think a great thing for future research is to figure out how can we have open source so we can all profit from each other's efforts and we still make enough money to feed ourselves. <laughs> Dave. 
uh, let me tell you about one sort of low-level thing. Um, people may tell you that if you want, see here I am talking about performance again, but tough, I'm a performance guy even if that's not always what matters these days. Um, don't let people tell you that if you want fast arithmetic, you have to be C and, or Fortran and get the wrong answer quickly. Um, it's not that hard <coughs> to have a language whose semantics is mathematical accuracy up until you run out of memory and recognize when you can compile it as machine arithmetic. And the, clue, the key to that is type inference and range inference in the compiler. And I'll see if I can give you a 30 second example. Suppose you have a, you know, a for statement or whatever it's called in your particular language iterating over an array. So the subscript i goes from 0 by 1 what, uh, and you terminate when it's no longer less than the length of the array. With no declarations at all, right away you know that i is either 0 or i plus 1. So if you can solve that recursive type equation in your compiler, then you know that i is a non-negative integer. And you also know that i is either 0 or it's a value less than the length of the array plus 1. So if you can propagate the subrange restrictions that come from conditionals, then you know that the value of i is not larger than the length of the array. Actually, in your compiler, you probably know it's less than the length of the array plus 1. So if, you have, so if the only declaration in the entire program is what the length function returns, then you know that i is an integer in the range between 0 and that. And that allows the compiler to choose a suitable representation, such as the hardware-supported 32-bit integer. So with no declarations to go wrong and no untyped casts or any other of that junk, the compiler can take the abstract, mathematically accurate uh, formulation of the program and get the same machine code that C would generate. Now that doesn't work in all cases, but it works in a lot of cases. And I think that's a good example of keeping things simple by putting the smarts in the right place. And you've saved a lot of people cycles. <laughs> thinking about declarations. Right. Thinking about people declarations. Cycles. Richard? Uh, I guess if there are any little known secrets out there, I don't think I know them. Um, <laughs> and uh, since what, what I have, what I do know, I've tried fairly, tried to some extent to make sure everybody can find out about. Uh, I don't have anything in, in particular for this moment. What, uh, what I did come up with thinking about this, uh, which of course is already mentioned a bit here, is um, to, to uh, look at the programs, writing programs, and programs reading programs. And so specifically for runtime things, uh, don't don't write runtimes. Uh, steal them, right? Instead of instead of coming up with a runtime, you write a piece of code that generates uh, something and just translate whatever you want into some other language, and then use somebody else's runtime. Or alternatively, if you are going to write a runtime, write a, write a runtime for something which is already out there, so that uh, people will then you know your runtime will get out there. It'll get you people will use it, and because if you if for programming languages that work as, as protocols, um, I know a few of these that mean like PostScript, um, C is now half a programming language, half a protocol. I suspect that most C programs nowadays are probably written by other C pro by other programs. Um, by looking at programming languages that way, you do get this you, you do get this kind of multiplicative effect because you. Have, um, People use the language because they're interesting servers. It's easy to write clients. So if the clients exist, then people go out there and write the servers. And so in, in this way, um, it has two <coughs> effects. One is that uh, it can minimize your work. It also can maximize uh, the utility of your work by making it possible for other people to use what you do in whatever, in their own environment. But I'm not I don't think that's a secret. Scott? Okay, this isn't this isn't a secret. This is just gonna sound maybe sound like an old fart. Um, so the thing, the I, maybe it is a secret. You have to recognize that this whole this whole discipline is a craft, and that if you look at any sort of pre-industrial age craft, there's a path to mastering a craft, and that involves you know being an apprentice, learning the skills you need for the craft, 
and then being a journeyman well what does that mean you know in in our in our profession that means finding the code of people who are really great and just reading the hell out of it and figuring out what they figured out you know stand on people's shoulders and you know and becoming masterful at any craft is, as a mentor once told me you know just requires character and discipline right uh, and now I have to tell a Dave Moon story because I didn't actually know this a long time ago one time I presented a design this is before I even knew what character discipline were I don't know if I've got there yet but but I know I wasn't there then because I was in a design meeting for something and I defended my design on the basis that I implemented over the weekend and Moon said to me the best put down ever any bozo can write code was <laughs> how he debunked my design. And of course, I was too pissed off at the time to actually recognize that that was the best piece of advice I ever got in my life. <laughs> so, so now, now it's great because even if you forgot it, I didn't, and I pass, I pass it on. <laughs> well, even if it didn't really come from me. No, it really came from you. It really came from you. And. <laughs> And I felt well and truly criticized. <laughs> and so, so that's the suggestion that we should have programs to write our code for us. That's possible. <laughs> Instead of both. <laughs> Instead of both. <laughs> Instead of both. <bozos>, right? <laughs> yeah, I might still be a bozo, but at least I know that I can. <laughs> okay, we're gonna move on to question number four: Good ideas that have been dropped, but whose time has now come, and. Uh, We'll start back with Dave. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't like the question very much, so I don't know if this answer is responsive to the question or not. But sure. um, I'll talk about trends. Um, in the old days, the goal was efficiency at any cost. And we had languages like C and Fortran that made you basically decide what assembly language you wanted, except for a few minor details, and then uh, write code that would cause the compiler to generate that assembly language. Um, now, say in the decade that we're in the middle of, or maybe, it, I don't know if the periods are exactly decades, doesn't matter. In the current era, the goal is rapid development. Um, maybe that era actually ended with the stock market crash a year ago. It's a little hard to tell yet whether it's ended, but the goal is rapid development, so we have Things to facilitate that, automatic memory management, extensive runtime checking, um, and most importantly, very large libraries. And that's characteristic <coughs> of languages like Java and Visual Basic. And Common Lisp was kind of ahead of its time there, except the library was way too small, as is obvious if you look at the Java <laughs> library. Um, you know, they just, just didn't cover very much. But I think the trend that is coming and maybe is starting to arrive. Again, you know, it takes hindsight to know exactly when these things happen. The trend is that efficiency at any cost is only important for a few specialized things written by a few wizards to um, run inside your cell phone or something. And rapid development in itself is just rapid production of headaches and unmaintainable garbage. <laughs> and what, what is really going to be the thing that everyone realizes they need is maintainability and transparency of software. You know, the opposite of spaghetti code. Um, I don't, I can't tell you what technologies will give us that. Maybe you can tell me. The obvious one is non-textual programming, you know, programming in visual <coughs> form instead of text. But that's been tried over and over for uh, probably 40 years and has never worked except in very specialized areas. Um, but maybe that doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Maybe it just wasn't done the right way or something. Anyway, I think that if you're looking for something to work on that will become, um, that will hook into the hot trend in a few years, that might be a good bet. Maintainability and transparency. The ability to produce software which naturally and easily comes out maintainable and transparent. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Tucker? I'm going to go back to a topic Dave touched on, which is the specialized hardware. <coughs> we were all taught it can never happen, but I, I think it is going to happen. And I think there's a, a number of ideas that Lisp and Lisp machines had that 
we're going to see come back and, and we'll be able to re-exploit. The three that I wrote down is garbage collection, tag memory, and microprogramming. I wrote a slide on each, but I'm just going to quickly um, try and skip to, to the one that I think is, is maybe the most interesting, which is the idea of microprogramming. And I'm just going to give a quote that, I, that Dave Ungar uh, made sort of off the cuff a few years ago at Oopsla. He said, and, and this echoes something that Dave said, modern processors are like nitro-fueled funny cars. They excel at the quarter mile. Unfortunately, modern programming languages are like Monte Carlo. They're full of twists and turns. And if you look at the memory hierarchy, which Dave also alluded to, and you look at the... Uh, the ratio of how many registers you have versus how many bits you can store on your hard drive and the speed of those registers and the speed of getting those bits off the hard drive there's I'm estimating probably six orders of magnitude difference between the two of them and I just sort of looked at what was on my hard drive today and I will admit most of it was full of mp3s <laughs> <laughs> followed by a lot of JPEGs from my new digital camera but the thing after that was code. And the MP3s have a nice compression algorithm, and so do the JPEGs. What's the compression algorithm for code? I think it's microprogramming. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, what you're actually saying is sort of what uh, uh, Scott said earlier. Um, you know, virtual he machines. Should we talk about it? <laughs> are, are, <laughs> we um, did talk about yeah. that. Um, I mean, uh, modern proce programming modern processors at the assembly language layer looks a lot like what I remember doing microcode <laughs> looked like. Mm -hmm. You have many of the same kinds of issues um, and maybe that's maybe that is uh, where things are going. Scott? Um. This sort of addresses Dave's point, but I think one of the things, so I guess this is good ideas who, you know, that have been dropped, but whose time is with us again. So I'll try to, I actually try to answer some of that. And, you know, one of the observations is, is that, you know, the, the era we're in right now, like it or not, is the Java era. Um, I guess, ooh, you could tell what I think about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no offense. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and the, the fact is, 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 for what it is, Java isn't bad. And it learned some good lessons, right? It learned, it learned lessons about sort of late binding. And it learned lessons about you know, the importance of things like, like safety, you know, type safety. And didn't quite get it right, but it got some of the lessons. a garbage lessons. collector, too. Garbage collection, interactive development environments. Um, and in fact, the dynamic language community you know, that I'm part of has actually taken some lessons back from the static uh, language community, and languages like Cecil and Dylan are good examples of that. Um, it's, time, it's, it's time to figure out how to push the static language community to steal some more ideas, because that's what masterful people do anyway, right? They, they steal ideas. And, you know, a good idea that isn't apparent in Java is that classes aren't namespaces. Right, that's a that's a that's a spaghetti disaster. Um, organizing interfaces around interfaces are collections of functions. So why isn't code organized around functions? You know why why is code in Java organized around the abstraction of a class rather than the abstraction of a generic function? It's time to go back for that. And then the big one. Um, Oops, my screen just went blank, so I'll have to admit, I don't, I can remember this one. Syntactic abstraction is the key to yeah. reducing the complexity of code. And nobody has caught on to, nobody's caught on to hygienic macros. And it's, it's time for that to change. It's super important. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't say anything about the implementation technology that I'm using at my company or else someone would shoot me. But in, in one language where, it, so I have some apples to apples comparison that's showing a, an expansion of code of 24x for the same code between, between some other language and Java. And <laughs> I have to tell you, that was, that's my worst case nightmare scenario was an explosion of 10x. So I wasn't even close. Um, and it's all due to the syntactic abstraction that this other language provides. 
So, so it's not assembly language. It's not assembly language. No. <laughs> it's not that kind of macros. Um, the other thing, which anyone who knows me is one of my pet things, is is it's time to think about the the application of types to to the interfaces of programs, um, especially in this client-server relationship we now have, where you know we're we're back to the IBM model, you know, where you've got a you know you've got a, a card <coughs> punch on your on your machine at home. It just has a return key instead of a you know an enter button, and you know a packet goes out instead of a punch card, and that just means that getting talking about types across the network in a way that both of those expensive pieces of hardware that you have can do something useful. Um, oh, and the idea that came from was CLIM and dynamic windows before that. So that's an idea that's been around for, oh, I guess in Sicarelli's paper for 20 years now. So. Richard? Uh, I just wanted to mention that I, I have caught on to hygienic macros, so somebody has. <laughs> um, but uh, speaking of the sort of the big IBM systems, uh, the, the what thing, what the thought, the thing that I picked up on as a good idea whose time has, has come back is uh, time sharing. Mm -hmm. And it used to be uh, computers are these big expensive things, and because of that, you had to share them with other people. And a whole lot of work went into setting them up so that people could share them without stepping on each other too much or getting into too much trouble. Uh, and then the computers got very cheap and everybody could have their own and nobody paid attention to that anymore. So uh, now have these computers where there's essentially you know, put whatever program you want on it and it can do whatever it wants. Um, as somebody was talking to uh, uh, is it re reforming, reformatting the hard drive is, is a right. <laughs> your, your programs need to be able to do that. <laughs> um, so, well, if they're uh, a good virus, they do. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and it's true now, the computers are still cheap, so in fact you are the only person sitting at the computer, but because that computer is, you know, either pro probably connected to a network, and even if it's not that, it's running a lot of programs written by other people. And so you start something, and it starts something else, and it starts something else. So, and, and there's this all these different programs running on your machine, some of which you probably don't even know about. So it is turned back into a multi-user machine. And so and we need to go back to, uh, to dealing with it as a multi-user machine and to, so that the different programs can run and not step on each other. Now I'm not suggesting that we just go back and take ITS and put it on our machines nowadays. Uh, because it's, it's, it's not a bad idea, really. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you do need some, these, these programs have to be able to run with each other and they need to protect themselves from each other. And uh, the operating systems available today aren't going to help very much since they either never heard of protection or are still using protection from 1960. Um, and it really, so really it turns into a language level issue. And uh, it's something I think you can solve much better from the language, from the language level uh, using uh, techniques that have been around for, for a long time but are, are uh, coming back I into use or maybe becoming useful, uh, such I guess the one that I've been uh, looking into recently is capabilities, uh, which in, uh, in, uh, in the area I work in uh, sort of comes to, becomes uh, Lambda, the ultimate security tool. <laughs> and so, I don't know, get a better rise. <laughs> um, well. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so try it again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, so that's the, the the idea whose time has come back is is uh, time sharing and uh, all the issues and the solutions and problems that come with that. Okay, great. Um, we're moving on to question five: pitfalls and gotchas. <laughs> and your time has come again, Richard. <laughs> wow. Um, Right. Uh, so, so I actually wrote down a whole bunch of things here, and I was thinking, great, if they come this way, one of these won't have been mentioned before. <laughs> but I oh, well, I'll let's start at this end, because I only have one thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll pick, uh, so I'll pick what's one, um, which uh, is, uh, is a pitfall, is, is the, uh, the, what I've got written down as the myth of the small language. 
Uh, and, <laughs> and he's from the scheme community. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and that, you know, there's all of these, there's all of these languages out there, and, and not just languages, but, you know, sort of protocols and all of these things. And, in fact, this comes back to what I've sort of been talking about uh, throughout this, and that is that nothing is sitting in isolation anymore. So, if you write a small language, then either it just disappears and it doesn't matter, or if people actually start using it for something, then it's slowly going to build up. People are going to write more programs in it. They're going to use it for things you didn't think of. They're going to try and connect it to other programs, to other protocols, and use it in different ways. And so it grows and it grows and it grows. So initially you thought you had a little language. And well, people just write small programs, right? I don't need namespace <laughs> control, right? And then, then you see the first 10,000 line program in this thing. And my god, how could they do that? <laughs> So, so you, you really have to think about, you know, even as, you know, Scheme is a small language, say, but, but even as a small language, to, to be useful and to, uh, and if it, if it succeeds and gets widely used, it will be a big language. So you have to start right from, you have to start from the beginning thinking about as a big language, including the kind of features that big languages use, and also there's a library issue. Right? There's all kinds of other pieces of software and equipment and whatnot people are going to want to connect to. So they need to be, they need to be able to do that. Because if, if you don't put it in, they will. Um, so you have, to, you have to think big. And one way to do this is to you know, piggyback on top of other things. If you translate into other languages, then you can take advantage of what they've done in terms of interfacing and, and solving the same problems. Uh, but you have to think about them. You can't just sit down and write a small language anymore. Yeah. Thanks. Scott? Yeah, I'm with him. Um, ignoring scalability is a pitfall. Um, you just, you know, even when you're keeping things simple, you have to make sure you're not painting yourself into a corner. Um, and, yeah, uh, well, I guess the other thing is what Dave said right at the beginning, which is, you know, thinking that you're smarter than you actually are and you know maybe everybody's like super duper smart but the fact is is you know after you've written something and are suddenly forced to come back to it a year later you know even if you were that smart at the time you aren't now <laughs> <right>? <laughs> so that's uh, yeah yeah I, I mean the pit maybe it, there's just a big pitfall is that this is just really hard stuff and not realizing that it's really hard is is a huge mistake. Okay. I didn't really uh, come up with anything here because there are so many <laughs> small choice, you know, small things that just kill you all left and right. And uh, so many of them just come down to um, abstraction violations, not using good abstractions. Um, and that will haunt you. Tucker? In keeping with my theme that I'm only a journeyman, not a wizard, I came up with a, a bunch of quotes from some real wizards, but I'm just gonna read my favorite one, which is from Michael Jackson, the rules of optimization. Rule number one, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Rule number two, which is for experts only, don't do it yet. <laughs> Dave, that's all? Okay. Uh, looking over my list of pitfalls and gotchas here, none of them is actually a, pitch, a pitfall or a gotcha. So I'll give you one pitfall slash gotcha from my current work, and then I'll go over what I had prepared. Um, if you're using C++ and you want to write portable code, don't use any of the features of C++ because none of them work at all compilers. <laughs> <laughs> and for wizards, don't use C++ yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, Alright, so, some, some advice. It's not really specific pitfalls. Again, uh, keep things as simple as you can, but not simpler. Work really, really hard up front to make things simple. Um, when you're done making your design simple and you're going to actually implement something, start with a small 
working system and expand it incrementally, adding functionality and adding performance. Um, it's much easier to do it that way. The Big Bang way only works for God. <laughs> Everybody else has to use evolution. Um, and, and related to that, <laughs> Related to that, um, one of the most boring things to do in the entire world is writing test suites. <laughs> but it's really, really worthwhile to do. If you have test suites and unit tests, that is both tests of the large functionality and tests of the pieces, you, and they have good coverage, you can make changes um, with some confidence that, that if they're wrong, you'll find out about it fast, which gives you a lot more freedom to make small changes and experiment with things. And finally, one piece of advice, which I shouldn't have to say, but I keep having to say this over and over. Sometimes an error message actually means exactly what it says. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in your own code, you should strive to increase the number of such error messages. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say. Thanks. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions. Um, we're going to um, give priority to stu grad students and, and particularly grad students in our class. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we do have a mic here. Should work. Pick you up if you want to stand up first. Um, who wants to go first? <laughs> um, I just have a quick question to something that Scott said. You, you were saying that you. Um, we're concerned about Java um, being a language where the central focus should be on the function and yet all the file systems are being done based on the class. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say Java might be an example of you know, a language which is trying to focus on the class rather mm -hmm. than being a, a function? And in that case, wouldn't it make more sense to, for Java to actually be that way? Um, I, I guess I think that it, it might want to focus on that. and. And I don't know the evolution of Java from, from day zero, so it's really hard to, it's, I guess that's another pitfall is second guessing right. people, right? So I'll try, I'll try not to do it. But, but you could argue that, for instance, the genesis of that came from the, maybe you can correct this, is when you're trying to download something over the network, a class is a pretty good modularity of something you're going to slurp up over the network especially when you equate file and class. But on the other hand, when you're really decomposing something into, into the natural functions of, of the protocol, they don't always lie along class boundaries, for instance. And you don't have to look very far in Java to see where it just starts to fall down, right? I mean, the math library was put in very early, for example. <laughs> and it, and, it, and I mean, it must have been one of the very first extra libraries. And, it, and that model had already started to break down by the time they got that far. Um, and particularly in the face of, of you know, multi-methods, a la CLOS or Dylan or Cecil, you know, where does something live, right? You just can't think about it that way. And I think it's, you know, I, you know, I don't think multi-methods are a good thing just because I happen to come from that community. It's just sort of the way, it's just the way functions work. That's what they do for a living. Um, so, did that answer your question? Well, thank you. Okay. Um, well, hold on, let me give the grad students. All right, don't be shy. <laughs> um, for whoever is interested in answering this, um, so, um, a lot of theoretical work has been done on various types of program analysis and, and you know, analysis of properties of functions and procedures and variables and things like that. And in a few cases, those types of analysis have gotten into languages in semantically interesting ways. Like, for example, a whole chapter of the Java spec is, is on this concept of definite assignment. And that turns, it, turns into a useful semantic property that you can rely on in your programs. And, and you know, you can envision tons of other properties like that that, could, that the language could semantically help you out on. But I don't, I don't see many of those actually appearing in languages. Why do you think that is? And do you think it's something that like needs to be worked on? How do you think you know that could be addressed? But like things like for storage allocation, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of other properties that you know you can uh, make improvements on that way. 
probably more than one of us should answer yeah. that. Um, my take is most language designers are not intellectuals. They're not really as interested in thinking as you might hope. They just want to get some language done and start using it. And so stuff like that is hard, and so it tends to get dropped because it's too hard to do a good job on. Um, that comes out of some, some of my language design experience would support that. I do think that there could be some value in getting more semantics of the program you know, written down in the program. I don't like the example you gave from Java because I think that's just trying to paper over a defect in the language. But your general point, I think, is valid. Um, I think part of the issue there is that they're taking a good idea and turning it into an implementation is a lot of work yeah. very often. There's a lot of grungy details. And um, very often, um, you know, the people who are going to have to deal with those grungy details are, you know, their salaries are being paid by somebody who, you know, wants results yesterday. Um, and so it's really hard to find the time to um, work through something sort of interesting at that level and turn it into a real usable thing in a, in a product. And the guy who wants the result yesterday is being paid by a consumer who thinks it's okay if his program unexpectedly quits. Right. <laughs> Just not yeah. too often. The other thing is when you look at examples of languages that have really tried to do it right, like you're surely thinking of like ML or Haskell or yeah. something like that, is it turns out that, I mean, they're just really, really hard. Right, it's just really, I think those things end up just being very, very difficult. It's usually provably impossible to come out yeah. the cases. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, is if you look at like ML, for instance, you know, one of the things they've done is to, is to really, in order to have a, a reasonably complete type system, they've had to sort of, well, self-consistent, I guess, they've had to really, you know, lop off stuff that is just pragmatically useful. You know, so on the one Maybe it's a difference between science and engineering too, isn't it? Because ML is really, you know, ML was sort of done as as a piece of science, and well, you know, Common Lisp, for example, is a piece of engineering, right? It's there are very different kind of trade-offs there. So, yeah, a good tough question. Okay, who else? Um, hold on. Okay. Yeah, you're up. Hi. I'll get to you next, Ali. As the added complexity and potential inefficiency of multi-methods worth, worth the game, a critic might say that it's a pretty heavyweight solution to the binary operation problem. I think the computational equipment, it's a matter of, from my point of view, there are less people cycles involved than the guy writing the multi-method. Right. And, I mean, there are a dozen people in the room who could probably answer that question, but the fact is, is in the face of in the face of good type in information, either declared or inferred, and in the face of a reasonable library compilation mod model, there just isn't any difference in efficiency. And in fact, if you end up having to do sort of staged single dispatch, you get hosed because when it comes time to sort of do, you know, share registers and information across the staged thing, the multi-method stuff all gets packaged into a neat little thing and just does much better anyway. Um, you know, go talk. Go talk to Jonathan about all of this. He can he can probably refute you point by point for for hours. Okay, um, Sam, do you have a question? So I'm interested in different uh, proof techniques and, and things like that in, in terms of programs. So I'm I'm wondering what you guys think about uh, sort of whether it's whether you know, like either hand generated or automated automated proof techniques when you're writing programs is is in any way feasible. Uh, what, whether you think it can be increased, uh, whether you think it's worth like being able writing a program in which you can express more complicated properties than just normal type systems that you know have to be proven by hand, and whether that's useful in any way. Uh, proving program correctness would be a great idea. If it, I've never seen it work, but I've never really <laughs> tried to look for it. So I think I think I'm saying that I'm ignorant. Um, 
I'd say that um, I'm encouraged by the fact that type systems seem to have gotten better um, and that there is real utility there. Um, some of the, you know, there are syntactic issues in some languages that make the make dealing with types clumsy, but those are you know more syntactic issues than and than anything else. And there is useful stuff that comes out of it. So I'm encouraged by that. You know that the formalisms for type systems have, I think, improved it, um, our lives. But how much further we can go, I don't know. I, I'd probably claim ignorance like Dave. That's not an area that I've um, studied very much. I'm, I'm in ignorant of, of current progress in it, but I know 20, 30 years ago in the security business they were trying to do program proof, automated program proof. There was some success there, and I know that that effort continues. So and it's obviously it would be a great thing if you could know that your program is really going to do what you wanted it to do. But I know that it's still an area of research. I, mean, I think that it, it's, it's quite largely a trade-off issue in the sense that it, you know, producing correct programs is more work than producing incorrect programs. And uh, so there are programs, you know, large programs, which people have proven correct. At least probably what that means is it was proven correct according to some specification, but then is the specification the right specification? Um, so it, it, never, it never actually bottoms out. And you say, I, you know, I had truth here. Um, but it, 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 it just greatly really increases the cost of the program. And so if it's in an environment where that really matters, then uh, I think um, there has been some success with that. But there's also been success with just paying a lot of people and setting up a sort of institutional structure to produce correct programs as well. So um, obviously, you know, the more you can automate, the cheaper it's going to be to do it. But ultimately, it's always going to be easier to write. Uh, it's going to be cheaper to produce correct but not provably correct programs than it is to produce provably correct programs. Sometimes it's harder to get things done correctly. Can I ask a question back? Is there sort of sort of a statistical notion of proving something correct? That is to say, if you have something that obeys a set of, you know, some set of protocols, and you can actually, you know, bound the inputs, then you just start start firing dot, darts <coughs> at it and see if it actually is. That is to say, is it enough to actually? So I'm thinking of sort of security of just not downloading viruses and whatnot. Could you conceive of something that would actually? that would actually give you a reason, this thing with reasonable probability does what it says it's going to do as opposed to this thing absolutely positively provably does what it says it's going to do? Yeah, I think, I mean, it tends to be right, a really big search space and you kind of only can get a sampling and it obviously is highly dependent on the problem, but I guess that could be sort of considered a proof, a proof system or at least, you know, increasing your, your faith in the reliability. You can tell I'm ignorant too, but right? <laughs> this, this just seems really hard and really valuable. Perhaps an alternative to correctness is accountability. Yeah, maybe. It's hard. I think there's a there's a bunch of factors that inspired to make a, a language hard to use, like uh, maybe lack of documentation or reliance on really complicated abstractions. I'm wondering what your uh, peeves are, what your favorite peeves are for things that make Language, language is difficult to use, and, uh, and what you think uh, things that one could do to make them easier. My pet peeve is any language that makes me type something twice when I didn't, when I shouldn't have had to. Yeah, yeah. like the same type like declaration over and over again. <laughs> yeah. That's one. Another is languages where that have a lot of things in them that almost but not quite work. <laughs> <laughs> That definitely contributes to usability. And, and the one you mentioned is very important, poor documentation. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, being based on weird ideas that I don't understand <laughs> <laughs> makes it hard to use for me. And it's not easy to tell whether that's a problem with me or with the language. 
and having weird syntax, <laughs> not to yeah. mention any particular scripting languages or anything, but <laughs> having, having weird syntax where... Um, <laughs> Where you can write the same thing 17 different ways? Yeah, where, where small changes in the input do not produce errors, but produce wildly differing changes in the output. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, you know, having 27 different ways to do the same thing, except slightly different, you know, let's say wildly different efficiency models. And the other thing is, you know, I guess this is a mea culpa for everybody who worked on common lisp is sort of failure to to draw modularity boundaries between things. I think we really blew it. We didn't know it at the time, but I think we blew it in common lisp when we just made this big old fat manual instead of a bunch of little skinny ones that you could all put on a on a shelf next to each other. So um Java learned that lesson pretty well actually. They Yeah, they're really good at no, but the point is, is the point is, is you can get one book that talks about one thing. Yeah, I think yeah. there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a gold mine for O'Reilly. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of real-time claims can modern runtime systems make with all the scheduling and garbage collection and everything? So the um, cycles. Well, garbage collection, I think, can be dealt with in a real-time system. Um, I have personal evidence of that. Um, I, I have a garbage collector that's been 800 feet into an oil well. <laughs> Did it come and out again? Yes. <laughs> And it's planning. We're planning on sending it down um, several miles in a couple months. Um, it's obviously more rigorous than having it in the copy well, machine. I mean, <laughs> some, one of the last things Symbolics did was to to write a, a version of Genera called Minima that actually had a that was well. It's it's real time on sort of the millisecond scale, right? Mm -hmm. Which yeah. actually had boundaries on the amount of time you would spend in garbage collection and whatnot. And it was meant to actually run inside a phone switch. And Harlequin won up them and made one and that actually did right. run in real time. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, and then, Har and then Harlequin actually did the same thing, basically in PCs, right? And I mean, it, it sort of passed all of the, you know, even with garbage collection, it, you know, did everything and, you know, sort of, the millisecond time frame, which was actually the the boundary of the requirements. So, and that was with you know machines that are you know well that was what five years ago. So that was with machines that were you know twenty times slower than ones well, running and, now. And the trade-off was a fixed but bounded cost. It yeah. Was maybe a larger cost, but it was fixed. Yeah. Or it was bounded. At least. Yeah, it was and it was predictable too. I mean, it was very so so definitely at least three existence proofs of, of it working. So what are the hard issues as of now in uh, delivering real-time performance in front of real time? Um. Okay, we're going to open it up. Okay. Uh, Will, did you want to ask a question? Okay. Who uh, wants to ask me? Uh, some of the stuff that has been talked about is um, seems to me to be in the realm of uh, sufficiently smart compilers and sufficiently simple abstractions. And uh, the the state of the uh, skill of practitioners of the craft um, doesn't seem to be able to support sufficiently simple and elegant abstractions. So the way um, uh, industry deals with this is by working on very small problems and uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of advancement not in big big elegant systems I guess uh, but rather in uh, uh, very small things that is on specialized hardware uh, telephones uh, toaster ovens you know, this sort of thing. 
Uh, so I'm not sure what dynamic languages, and particularly dynamic runtimes, have to offer in, in this specialized space. Um, but what I do think they have something to offer is in making these various specialized things work together, where you don't have control over the abstractions, um, where you've got a lot of different software written by different people with different abstractions. Uh, it seems to me a dynamic language and a particular dynamic runtime <coughs> can adapt to that. Uh, would any of you like to comment on uh, the, the <coughs> strength of, of dynamic languages and dynamic runtimes for those two different purposes? Um, I'd like to interject one comment first. Um, I don't think the, you know, the canonical sufficiently smart compiler is the answer to much of anything. When we were talking about simplicity, I at least, and I think most of the other people here, did not mean, you know, included the compiler as part of, you know, keeping things as simple as you can make them and still get the job done. Um, yeah, I think a good example of that, by the way, is, is if you've never looked at, like, the GTK plus source code, which is just written in C, that's a really great example of terrific abstraction in in C, right? It's just beautifully designed. It's just my hat's off to whoever, I don't remember the name of the authors, but it's just great and, you know, it's just C. So. I, I also think, by the way, that the, the, the compilers that are smart enough to do any of the stuff we were talking about Got right. Um, given that you're wizards, uh, <laughs> I'd like to know what sort of things are part of your daily practice that you just can never understand why no one else does. <laughs> That's a really great question. Um, uh, test their code before checking it in. <laughs> um, uh, um, Explain what we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'm serious about that one, actually. Um, That's why I'm only a journeyman. I have checked it out. <laughs> Well, wizards do that too, but we always have a good excuse. Get That's, right. Quickly. That's right. That's right. I had to, I had to leave before, before I was going on vacation. <laughs> 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 I mean, I think the most useful practice is, you know, you know what this old mentor called character and discipline, and it's just always being skeptical. Right? It's being skeptical of, you know, yeah. well, it's okay to be skeptical of other people's stuff, but you should be even more skeptical about your own stuff, right? And you, you just you just can't hope to get better at what you're doing unless you're just really skeptical about everything. So it just, just makes you really insufferable too, unfortunately. So. Well, going back to your Bozo lesson, I guess think a bit before I start yeah. writing the code. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's awfully tempting to just start sketching up some code and before you know it. Well, it's no, much well, that's easier okay to too. do that than yeah. think about it, too. Yeah, well, you, you, it's okay to write some code and then think. You just can't leave out <coughs> the thinking part. bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, okay, it's okay to write some code to organize your ear ideas and then think and then throw that away and write some more code. Yeah. Right. Being, a, being willing to throw away code yeah. is... Although, mm -hmm. I have found that um, it's unquestionable that all kinds of computer monitors emit stupid rays that make you stupid <laughs> when you sit in front of them. <laughs> getting up and away from it is... Even the liquid practice. crystal. Yeah, even the LCD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Howie? Yeah, I, I wanted to pick up the thread that somebody was just raising, which was the embedded computing world. Um, Currently, I, the numbers I've heard from friends of mine who work in the auto industry is that a mid-range car right now has something on the order of 30 processors in it. Um, that's going up every year, and the high-end cars are already above 60. Some of those are, of course, things that are you know, basically watches, um, you know, four-bit computers doing some very specific things. But a lot of them are actually quite competent machines, the power PCs, for example. Um, and they're doing complicated tasks like running engines and transmissions. In fact, often it's 
one computer running the engine, one running the transmission, and beginning to think about them talking to one another. And then at the far extreme, there's the aircraft industry, which is, I don't know the numbers, but they're much larger. Uh, it strikes me that that's a field that really needs abstraction real bad. Um, I've talked to people who actually do the programming, and it's, it's the style of programming all of us did in our infancy. It's extremely low level. It's C at the highest levels. And uh, the assumption is that you can keep building complexity at that level. But my take is that, in fact, it's a world where um, both the thing you said, which is the combination of lots of extremely simple things in the ensemble, and also the internal complexity of those are growing very quickly. And that it's a field that needs both real-time demands and high reliability constraints, and provably so, and the power of abstraction from the traditions we come from. I was wondering if you guys want to comment on that. I'm really frightened about the idea that I will have a fly-by-wire car one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> that terrifies me. Isn't Gregor Kixalis trying to address this? Isn't that what his his aspect stuff is attempting to do? That's why Tucker's there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, yes. maybe I'm stupid, but I can't actually much see the difference between that and sort of well-crafted sets of macros. But, but that probably reflects my ignorance more than anything else. Yeah. A comment and a question. Uh, my comment is that I can't help wondering whether the watchword "keep it simple." is merely the mantra of an aging generation realizing that it's running out of time. I'm <laughs> <laughs> the memories of exuberantly wasting my time on trying to conquer complexities in these very walls 25 years ago, and I have mixed feelings about denying that joy to today's graduate students. <laughs> well, I did say if you want to have fun, you should elaborate complicated ideas. Excellent. <laughs> well, my advice is have some fun. My question is, what does the panel think of literate programming as a spouse by Donald Knuth, for example, as a means of uh, enhancing maintainability and reliability? Well, that idea is in Java, right? You can intermix documentation with code by itself. You know, that's great, but by itself it doesn't do that much. I think it's done rather badly in Java. But, yeah. But if you look at the source code for tech or something, it's... It, it's qualitatively different from just reading a source code listing. I wonder if any, uh, any experience or opinions about that. Well, um, for it to work well, it requires writing well. And that is unfortunately something that isn't taught particularly well. Um, That's a good point. Now, yeah. uh, comments are only worth, worth the, uh, the, the, you know, the amount of thought that went into them. Um, and unfortunately, maintainability and future um, you know, transfer of information to the next person who's going to read the code is not given a lot of weight in many, in many organizations. Um, there are exceptions to that, um, but there's a lot of non-exceptions. Also, it, it uh, increases the amount of effort required to write comments in the first place. Instead of just, type it, just typing in what you think of it, you almost you've got to work it into whatever the, the literate programming language, you know, the format expects comments in. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not a big obstacle, but it's an obstacle at a point where people have all of their own obstacles already in front of them. Uh, so uh, I think it's sort of a part of the question of what kind of comments. I mean, for, for Knuth, I think there was definitely a sense to which, you know, he did publish a thing as a book, right? People were going to read it as a book. In that case, it's, you know, sure, types up the whole thing. Um, but for something that people aren't going to read publish as a book and simply going to ask to read the code, it's not clear there's quite as much as much value. I think, I think the point about I mean, you put them together for a reason, right? The point of having fun and then asking about literate program are really, I mean, in some sense, you know, the exuberance of just having fun programming is really sort of a solo activity, right? Where you just write yeah. something for the sheer pleasure of doing it because you can do something complicated and hairy and then it just magically works and it's great and that sort of thing. And, you know, we all have a boundary on exactly how much code we can write that does so much 
and then there's the requirement if you're say an industry where where it's just more than one person can can do and then all of a sudden well you have to leave back a little bit of that you have to leave behind some of that exuberance because you because there are other people doing it too and you've got to you know you've got to write stuff that all of you can do something with and and it's interesting because I mean in my experience people people don't even work to keep comments up to date never mind writing them carefully to begin with so even though even though in theory it strikes me as a great idea I just I'm not sure how you actually you know culturally get people to realize that that's what do you do you, you take the Dykstra rule, right? You fine everybody a dollar for every line of code they write and pay them two dollars for every comment they write or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know. Can, can I say something more about literate programming? Um, I'm not sure the novel is really the best model for how to <laughs> capture a design. Um, I have believed for a very long time without any evidence that source code should be part of a, just a small part of a vast um, hypertext that links um, the source code to the reason why things are the way they are. Um, I haven't really seen that implemented, but you, know, you should be able to look at any line of code and say, uh, let me find the discussion that led to this being the way it is and the design criteria and the, um, you know, the test cases that refute other ways of doing it and so on. And of course, that would be a far larger bulk of information than you could actually absorb when you're trying to maintain the program. But it seems like something along that line where the links between things that exist at the instant they're created are not lost to history could be valuable, especially if there's some way to automatically summarize that vast you know, email mm -hmm. archive. Mm -hmm. Okay, I saw you. Yeah, of course. A um, bit more mundane question. Um, I was curious. Um, you feel that uh, source level debugging is important in uh, designing a language, and if you do, how do you resolve the tension between that and also the desirable features of having uh, code generators, like hygienic macros or, or other uh, sorts of generation facilities? You've got to be you've got to be smart in your source level debugger so that it can you know, backtrack from all. The, it has to be able to backtrack all the way from the machine code bits to the original source code and everything interesting in between. That's not always easy. We never solved that on the list machine. But that's that's our, the requirement. We did we came close in Harlequin Dylan, but we but but in effect sort of the rule based macro stuff makes it easier than Lisp style macros, but even so I think it's a good research project. <laughs> I think we did the worst job because we had powerful tools in other areas that made us an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of the talk about when we're talking about runtimes, implicitly here we're all talking about, you know, single language, single application, but I know that some of you are sympathetic to the idea of object oriented operating systems. Um, do you think you need object oriented operating systems to accomplish some of the goals and, and things you want from computer systems and kind of a separate question do you think you'll ever be able to work on them if you're interested in that because it seems like it's um, right now it's looking pretty dark for that sort of thing we all know it would be good mm -hmm. i wonder what you mean by object oriented operating system well i mean where the safety of the safe the integrity of the system can take advantage of all the things that object or as opposed to just the um, application or process or module or class um, extend the, the benefits of OO design down to uh, down to level the integrity of the system you know whereas most of the time right now we can run in our nice little sandboxes inside Unix or NT or whatever but then we're at the mercy of um, certain certain limitations and the operating system that you know that are, that are due to the way that operating systems have been structured traditionally. Well, the world is full of an increasing number of object-oriented pieces of operating systems, whether it's object-oriented APIs for device drivers or application mm -hmm. frameworks, stuff like that. Something where there's the same object model throughout the operating system 
Yeah, I don't know if that idea will come back. Uh, I'll take but, it. But you, can, but you can get a lot of benefit from the pieces, can't you? Yeah, that's true. A, a different poke at that idea. To me, the operating system is where you put the pieces that are working right, because everybody needs them. And I would like to see object-oriented runtimes migrate into the operating system, in particular garbage collection, because you could do a much better job if you were closer to the hardware than you garbage collector. And object-oriented is like a slippery term, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, some people say, oh, that means the center of everything is sort of this class, and you go, well, is, are the instances of the class going to be self-identifying, right? Are they manifestly typed? Mm -hmm. That would be pretty useful. Right, I think, but, I think, but, yeah, I don't want to get into any particular flavors of object, but but yeah, the general self-identifying demarcation <coughs> construct that you know to be identified, uh, you know, that's probably the, the most general way to put it. Yeah, I'm sort of with Tucker on that, or maybe everybody. It's it would be nice, and who knows? I mean, at some point, for <laughs> safety concerns, something like that's going to be inevitable, or we're all we're all going to die in horrible accidents, <laughs> or you know that kind of stuff, right? Because the more the more we're depending on this for literally our safety, the more we have to start adopting that 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 kind of that set of ideas. Um, and the other thing, the other definition of object oriented, of course, is actually sort of you know protocol oriented, right? Should things just obey these discrete protocols, and you don't actually need objects for mm -hmm. that? And my, I mean. It strikes me that anything that more than a few people are working on is probably designed with that in mind anyway, so. Another term is that you're using is, is operating system. And it isn't so clear always what the operating system is and mm -hmm. where you draw the lines yeah. for that. Um, I mean, I've, you know, so I find working with runtime systems, it seems now more and more of what goes into it is stuff that 20 years ago was the operating system. Just because you need functionality that the operating system doesn't provide, so you have to provide it at that level, even though it's something that's traditional uh, an operating system does provide. You had a question? Uh, I have a really mundane question. Is there any decent way to do macros in Java? <laughs> <laughs> I've, got I've got a proposal for it. <laughs> Ask Jonathan. Okay. Yes, there is. Next question. <laughs> uh, um, do you guys, how do you guys feel about profiling as a way to get efficiency? Do you use profilers a lot in your own work? Um, do you have any tips about how to design your profilers? I would say that if you don't profile, um, you'll be optimizing the wrong things. Yeah. Um, your intuition is going to be wrong very often about what, where the, the, uh, the actual hotspots are. I think you have good intuition that it's not going fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, but finding out why is right. when you need the program. Yeah. I use yeah, Quantify a lot. It's really bad, but there isn't really anything better. Um, often it's a better idea to just add a little temporary code to collect <coughs> information about where the time is going. You know, get the places in your program that you think are interesting, get the time and record it. And that may cause you to change what parts you think are interesting, but it doesn't take very long these days to add temporary code and recompile. And a lot of times that sort of ad hoc tool is better than learning some package tool that doesn't really do what you want. And for instance, if you're hacking like in the web domain, all these web servers are just dynamically loading stuff and blah, blah, and you can't even can't even get a profiler around yeah. the code that right. you're trying to profile, so it's pretty painful. And of course, the problem with profiling is the problem that you want to profile, your data set or your input. Yeah, right. There's no sense in profiling a benchmark that doesn't at all resemble right. what your product is actually being used for. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, press. Um, Scott mentioned uh, that we should read the hell out of code. Um, I've read some of your guys' code, um, but what should I be reading today? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I don't know. 
The classics or the latest stuff? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tough to tell. <laughs> Top 40. Yeah. Some of it you're still not allowed to read. Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. I don't know. I actually think that the, you know, download, you know, download Bono's Dylan. Read that code. It's there's some pretty good stuff in there. Oh, is that open source? Uh, some of it. Some of it's open some source, it. but there's a lot of it where the source is published. It's not that is to say, it's not under sort of an open source agreement, but you can just. It's read, read source only code. Open yeah, source. read only, generous style open source, I guess. Uh -huh. um, actually, as sort of follow up to your question, one of the things that I found very valuable at Symbolics was the fact that generally, in order to make any modifications, you had to have a second person sanity check your code, and that's something that I've seen in very few other places. And you might, would you like to sort of address that? It's becoming more common. Um, the the whole you know, the extreme programming, pair programming <coughs> kind of uh, idea is becoming more common. And code reviews have been around for a long time. Um, Frederick Brooks also made the point, and I think he's right, that sort of the predictable outcome of a project is based on, you know, do you have one really talented chief architect or not? Right. If the answer is more than one or less than one, then your project will fail, the first <laughs> approximation. <laughs> and if you have exactly one, it will succeed. And, and he says, well, what's one of the jobs of that person? And one of the jobs of that person is to be like a wicked busybody, right? It's like, you know, it's like all code goes across that guy's desk, for example. And this is one of the things that sort of makes, well, that makes me insufferable, for instance. It's, it's like, I... In, in our stuff, I read everybody's code when it gets checked in, right? And we don't have a formal process, but I read it all. And I have to tell you that, you know, I fix like sort of five bugs every morning when I come in, you know, with my morning coffee because, and it's not because I'm being some brilliant genius or something. It's just because it's another pair of eyes. And I think that's in a, any sort of production environment, having somebody else read every line of code is really important. And one thing I'd never been convinced of until I actually had a good source code stepper is, is you know, one of those Microsoft books about project management and writing. Maybe it's in writing solid code. The guy says, run a source stepper on every line of code you can get to. And I said, what an amazingly laborious, stupid idea. <laughs> and then and then I gave it a try and it just I mean, if you think you don't have very many bugs in your program, that will that will embarrass you, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like you just every tenth line will go off. Right? It's just unbelievable. Um, yeah, the, the code review is is um, an essential idea. The only negative thing to say about it is there's a lot of different ways to do it, from you know line by line, very intense review where the reviewer really understands what's going on to a cursory examination. Um, and, you know, the value and the cost both vary tremendously for things that go by the name of code review. It's amazing what you can discover, though, just trying to explain your change to your reviewer, <coughs> even if he's not right. listening. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to start wrapping up. We'll have three more questions. Okay. Uh, Python uses a garbage collection technique of having reference counting and then backing that up with a generational... Uh, mark pass and sweep garbage collector. It does this in part uh, so that it will have predictable destructor uh, method invocations, uh, unlike Java, in which finalizer, finalizer methods are rather useless because you have no idea when they're going to be invoked. Uh, what do you think of this scheme? I don't know. What are the requirements? Yeah. Them? yeah. Well, it might have performance implications that are not good. I was wondering about that. I like it because it gives good semantics to the language, but I don't like features that may have really bad performance implications. Yeah, what, what's the requirement? I mean, yeah. you're carrying a lot, a lot of extra baggage to do that, but if the requirement the hard requirement is that destructors should predictably fire, then that strikes me as a pretty good way to meet that requirement. 
and then you just have to decide for yourself if you think that's a good requirement or not. Um, I, I mean, it, I guess it just depends how you feel like arguing that day. <laughs> you know, it, it, some, it might be a good thing. I don't know. Yeah. Um, one piece of code that I've had the um, misfortune of doing some maintenance on has essentially all of its logic in the destructors. So, <laughs> it, it, so it would not work at all in an environment that didn't have those characteristics. And you know, other things really um, care very little about when cleanup happens. So you know, there's no one size fits all answer problem. Uh, reference counts are good as long as you don't use them everywhere, certainly. Yeah. So uh, this is the, this is a I guess in a, in a dynamic language you're going to you're going to have the ability to like add and delete classes and types at runtime and um, you're also going to have to be doing a lot of type checks and um, I wondered if you had any ideas on how to do that fast when you also have to make sure the the whole thing is multi-threaded. I mean, I mean, get Dylan's, some help from the hardware. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's that. Well, and, and and Dylan also solved that by adding some engineering, right? Well, and Java does too, right? There's, you know, Java has a notion of things being final, and Dylan has the notions of things being sealed, and that just puts restrictions on where you can add and remove things. Um, I mean, there's a real trade-off between just pure flexibility and and high performance. You could also can. I mean, you could also think of it almost as sort of a you know truth maintenance sort of thing where you know where you've got a compiler that keeps track of assumptions that it makes and then retracts them as you change the rules on it. But I, yeah, I guess one question is what are you going to use it for and what are I mean if you need both the flexibility and the high performance, I think that would be challenging. All right, one more question. Uh, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on <coughs> adding, adding support and runtime system in order to record programs. So there's a what I what I do is when programs are distributed around, around the web, you may not be able to uh, always be able to you know, repeat the program over and over, or test it over and over. And so, um, is there any have you heard of projects or of ways of uh, uh, have you considered kind of Support the runtime just in the library and things. So I get to make a, a recording of the program under possible conditions that's a problem that is in many ways close to profiling um, and some of the same techniques seem to be used. I've seen you know coverage kinds of uh, uh, tools that you know basically change you know change a, a compiler switch kind of thing to insert additional code. Um, you can do that sort of arbitrarily um, keeping track of the sort of sequence of the program through its life is, is probably, it, well, is more expensive. Um, I don't think I've seen any tools you doing know, Henry, that usefully. Henry Lieberman actually did that yeah? with Chris Fry years ago over at the Media Lab for Z-Step Z or something. Henry Lieberman did this years ago. It's actually, you can sort of run programs forward and backwards and blah, blah, blah. And of course, it just just cons this gigabytes of stuff. <laughs> um, it's actually really cool, but it's, I mean, you just pay through the nose for it. Well, there's actually been work done at IBM Java. But um, because it's been being run on a single processor system, they can keep track of exactly. Um, there is, like, use the determinism of the Back the program is deterministic, so that when they want to back up, they go back and repeat the program. Repeat um, parts of the program. Repeat where the where, where, where just happens. Did um, somebody, Paul Wilson, did this demonic memory where they used the garbage collector to add, add 
at uh, sort of appropriate moments take a snapshot of the system and then they could go forward and backwards from those to, to replay what happened. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, let's thank our panelists. And I just want to say that we'll have two more of these, one on focusing on compilation, t advanced compilation techniques on um, 424, and then language design on 510. Thanks for coming.